Digimon World Dusk was released for Nintendo DS in 2007. I played this when I was a kid and remember loving it, and the game even got me into watching the TV shows for a bit. My memory of playing Dusk is a bit fuzzy, but for some reason this game still holds a very special place in my heart. So now, over a decade after its release, I did a playthrough of Digimon Dusk. Will it be as good as I remember it to be, or is nostalgia making me look at this game through rose colored glasses? Let's find out. Before starting a new game, we need to pick out a team of 3 Digimon. There's the Bounce Pack, Attack Pack, Defense Pack, and Pretty Pack. Right off the bat, I'll say that these Digimon designs still look awesome after all these years, and the pixel art makes the Digimon look so alive. They all look great, but I ended up choosing the Bounce Pack because that's the one I remember using in my first playthrough. My team's Digimon are called Lunamon, Machine Gyogamon, and Clockmon, but whenever I play these kinds of games I always give nicknames to my Mons, so you're going to be seeing them as Bonbon, Poncho, and Lord Kronos. In Digimon Dusk, our character is a Digimon Tamer, part of Team Nightcrow. If you do your playthrough on Digimon Dusk counterpart, Digimon World Dawn, your character is actually a part of Team Lightfang. Team Nightcrow is led by Chief Julia and her Digimon, Chaos Gauntmon, while Lightfang is led by Chief Glare and his Digimon, Ophanimon. Whether you play Digimon Dusk as a part of Nightcrow, or Dawn as a part of Lightfang, your playthrough experience will be very similar since the game's storylines mirror each other. But Dusk is better, don't at me. The game starts with us training for a tournament against Team Lightfang, but while training, we get attacked by some aggressive Digimon. Like, really aggressive. We quickly defeat them, but notice that those Digimon were acting really strange, as if they were being mind controlled. Then, a suspicious figure is spotted by Julia and Chaos Gauntmon before escaping. After that, we fast forward to the day of the tournament. Turns out, we're already in the final round, and my opponent is a Lightfang tamer named Ko. Our battle with him and the ones before it were part of a tutorial to familiarize us with this game's combat system. Digimon Dusk has turn-based combat, so it's mostly the usual stuff like attack, heal, or run away. We win our battle against Ko, but soon afterwards, we spot the same figure again, but he flees once more. We then celebrate winning the tournament with the rest of Nycro, and then go home to rest. But while at home, an enemy invades Nycro's base, Dark Moon City. It stops anyone in its way by knocking out tamers and turning Digimon into eggs. Fortunately, my Digimon didn't turn into eggs, but they did devolve into earlier stages of themselves. Now, with my weakened Digimon, I have to go into Dark Moon City and defeat the intruder. And this thing is honestly pretty terrifying. It's got question marks for its name, its design looks eerily out of place, and it has a really creepy laugh. <laughs> Even though it wasn't that difficult, I'm still a pretty big fan of this fight because of how ominous the boss felt. After defeating the boss, we learn more about the aftermath of this attack. The world of Digimon is, well, a digital world, obviously. Digimon, you, and everything around you are just a bunch of bits and bytes that exist on a server. And this enemy was a virus that hacked Darkmoon City. The city is usually connected by a center bridge to Sunshine City, which is where Lightfang lives, but this bridge has been blocked off. The city also lost access to a bunch of outside areas, but over time, we'll store access to those points. We're then assigned with a quest from Julia, which is investigating one of the few areas the city does still have access to, Sunken Tunnel. Sunken Tunnel is the first time we get to explore the wild on our own, and it's not the best first impression. Out of all the locations the writers could think of, like forests, mountains, deserts, they decide to put us in a sewer, which is a bit unflattering. Doo -doo water. Exploration in Digimon Dusk is done on an isometric map and as you walk around, you'll encounter random battles. At first it's cool, because you get to see a bunch of Digimon and their awesome designs. But it doesn't take too long for the novelty to wear off, and the random encounters start feeling way too repetitive. Once you've seen one part of an area, you've pretty much seen the rest of it, as visually, it's all the same. The map design is also very... questionable, to put it lightly, as we run into a lot of dead ends and backtrack a lot, which then leads to even more random battles. After grinding through the area, I eventually get to the end of Sunken Tunnel, there, I encounter an aggressive Digimon for a quick boss fight. After beating him, we find out that he was actually being mind controlled to attack us. I then head back to Darkmoon City to report this to Julia. Turns out, that virus from before didn't attack just Darkmoon City, but it attacked the entire digital world and is affecting Digimon everywhere. This is why that Digimon we fought back there was mind controlled. Nycro members are still trying to figure out more about what damage the virus caused, so in the meantime, I'm tasked with completing miscellaneous quests to help Digimon in the city. From here on out, the quest system is what drives Digimon Dust's story forward. There's this room in Darkmoon City where you can get assigned side quests by the Digimon on the edges of the room. 
and after you complete their side quest, you go to the Digimon in the middle for what's called a Union Quest. Union Quests are ones that actually matter to the story, and after you do the Union Quest, you get more side quests, finish the side quests, get a new Union Quest, rinse and repeat until you beat the game. Unfortunately, these side quests are a bit lackluster. Every single one follows the same tedious pattern. To start out, you go to the counter to get assigned a quest, but here, they don't actually tell you the details of the quest. Instead, you have to go find a Digimon in Darkman City who then gives you the details, and they're not that easy to find. The quest itself always involves you going into the wild to find an item or a Digimon, and usually you'll have to battle some specific Digimon too. But a lot of times, it'll be an area you've already been in, so there's no novelty in even exploring the area. After that, you go back to Darkman City and tell the Digimon that you completed the quest, and finally, you go back to the quest room to collect your reward. I think this process is way more complicated than it has to be, and these quests don't even have any impact on the main story. So for the rest of this video, there will be a lot of times where I quickly gloss over the side quests, and then talk more in depth about the union quests that actually matter to the story. So now, here's what I did for the first batch of side quests. I went looking for a Digimon in the ruins, I picked up some items in the mountains, I found some shrooms in the forest, and I went to Sunken Tunnel to fight a fish dude. That's it. Not much to elaborate on here since these don't matter to the main story. After completing these, we then get assigned our union quest from Julia, which is called Explore Limit Valley. A new area has been discovered in a digital world called Limit Valley, and Julia tasked me with investigating it. I grind through the area finding some new Digimon, get lost, a lot, and then get to the end. I find this egg dude who summons a Caesarmon to fight me, but this guy isn't that tough, so it looks like everything is going to be just fine, right? The enemy shows its true form as Grimmon, and this dude is big, so big that he takes up 3 columns in battle. And this is something I remember loving about Digimon Dusk, and how insanely powerful and intimidating the bosses felt. And this size isn't just for show, this guy's tough. Bosses will usually have multiple turns in a row, which I guess is kinda of fair since it is a 3v1, but these attacks pack a punch, forcing me to use up a lot of my turns for healing so I don't die. My Digimon do eventually pull through, but it was a rough battle. Before fleeing, Grimmon threatens us, saying that we'll perish by the hands of one of our own. We then head back to Darkman City and report to Julia with what happened, and then after that, we continue with some more side quests. I felt pretty underleveled after that boss fight, and needed to figure out how to get stronger. This is where something called Digivolution comes in. There are 5 stages a Digimon can be in. The weakest is in training, then there's rookie, then champion, then ultimate, then finally the strongest stage, mega. And as the Digimon digivolves, it'll get better stats and more powerful moves to use in battle. The game started off by giving us some strong Digimon that were champions or ultimates, but then forced everyone back into the rookies, and now we have to keep digivolving to get back to the more powerful stages. In order to digivolve from one stage to the next, a Digimon has to battle to gain EXP and level up. But there can also be other requirements, like needing EXP from being specific types of Digimon, or needing a high enough stat. In some cases, it'll actually be impossible to digivolve depending on what limits your Digimon have. For example, I'd really like to evolve Cronus from a Solarmon to a Clockmon, but their level cap is 25 while I actually need to be level 33 to be a Clockmon. It is possible for me to digivolve into this thing at level 24 though. Yikes. In this case, I'll need to degenerate down a stage, and after that my Digimon will grow to be stronger than before after digivolving, and then I'll have better stats and a higher level cap. Which means for Cronos, I'll have to turn it into this thing, then go back to being a Solarmon, and then after that, I'll be able to digivolve into a Clockmon. Fortunately, my other Digimon don't have to go through that back and forth process yet, and can digivolve right away. I digivolved Poncho from a Galmon to a Geogamon, and Bonbon bon from a Lunamon to a Lekismon. Afterwards, I did a couple more side quests. One of them involved me beating up three of these drill dudes, and in the other one, I had to fight this thing. And I'm sorry, but this is gross, right? This should be illegal. Anyways, after those side quests, I get the next union quest from Julia. Nightcrow has detected some virus-like activity in a place called Loop Swamp, so it's my job to go check it out. I go there, get lost a lot, waste a lot of time in random battles, and then fight a boss. And I think we're already starting to see another pattern here. Every union quest is just you navigating to the end of some area to fight a boss. Even though the locations are different from mission to mission, I just can't help but think that all of them feel the same. At least the designs of the bosses at the end are something to look forward to. 
This boss is named Skull Baluchamon. At first when we meet him, it's a pretty funny interaction. He's like, oh hi, you're the guy I'm supposed to give this super illegal item to, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. But of course he finds out that I'm not the right guy, and we fight. And in this fight, I learned that poison is kind of the worst thing. If your Digimon becomes poisoned from an attack, they're going to take some damage every turn, and it just makes it really hard not to die. Even with most of my team now Digivolved as champions and using a bunch of healing items over and over, not everyone made it out of this battle alive. Unfortunately, Cronus is showing themselves to be the weak link here, but it's okay. He'll be strong one day. After beating Skull Baluchamon, he's surprisingly cooperative. He says that he's not really a bad guy, he was just simply hired to make an item called D-Word. This item is the reason for the virus activity that was detected by Julia earlier. He gives it to me, and then we head back to Dark Moon City. Turns out, this item can be used to restore parts of the city that were destroyed by that virus attack earlier. These restored areas contain extra shops that I didn't figure out were even there until much later in the game. But I guess it's nice that they're there. At this point of the game, I decided that I wanted to add some more Digimon to the team as backup. So I'd like to briefly introduce our three newest members, Squishy, Nemo, and Giggles. Although this game lets you keep six Digimon in your party, you can only battle with three at a time. So I guess the extra three are just going to be in the background leeching off the XP, while Bonbon, Poncho, and Kronos fight on the front lines. After adding those new Digimon to my party, I did the next batch of side quests. I went to the mountains to beat up a monkey for his bone, and I went to the sewers to beat up a pirate for his milk. And yeah, I don't think I'll explain those further. On to the Union quest. Julia tells me that Light Fang Tamers have been attacking Nitro Tamers in Resistor Jungle, so for this quest, I need to go there to stop them. When I get into Resistor Jungle, the background music gives me a bit of deja vu. Turns out, this game reuses music for some maps, but come on, reusing them for back-to-back -back missions? Whatever. While at the jungle, Kronos finally leveled up enough to digivolve into this thing. But of course, I degenerated them as soon as I could so that we could eventually digivolve into Kalakmon. I run into some tamers from Lightfang who are being weirdly aggressive and fight me. And at the end of the area, the boss for this quest is Ko, who if you don't remember, is that Lightfang tamer that we fought at the start of the game. His Digimon are almost the same as the first time we fought him, but for some reason he's missing one. At the end of our fight, he says that me and Nitro are actually the bad guys who are trying to take over the world, while him and Lightfang are the good guys who will stop us. Ko and the other's weird behavior makes us suspect that the virus is probably manipulating them over at Sunshine City. I go back to Darkman City to report this to Julia, and then continue on with some more side quests. For one side quest, I beat up a samurai, and for the other one, I beat up an Eminem. And I actually want to talk about this particular side quest for a little bit. This request came from a Digimon called Cressamon, and she says that her friend, Bomber Nanamon, accidentally bombed a guy named Prince Mamamon's house, and now wants me to apologize for her. Like, what am I supposed to say? Oops, sorry for bombing your house, but we're cool, right? And the dude whose house was bombed fights me, because, well, I'd be mad too. And he was absurdly strong. Like, I'm pretty sure this was a mega stage Digimon. And to make things even worse, he had a bunch of moves that poisoned me. This was just a side quest, but I felt like this was one of the toughest fights in the game that came out of nowhere. Anyways, on to the Union quest. Just like the one at Loop Swamp, some virus activity was detected in a different area called Pallet Amazon, so I'm tasked with going there to check it out. And I just gotta say, I hate this place. I already mentioned this earlier, but Digimon Dust map design is questionable. Some areas have a gate that blocks your way, and in order to open the gate, you have to find a key somewhere. After you find the key, you find a pillar that you can put the key in, which will open the gate. It's a simple and common game mechanic to block your progress and force you to explore an area. In the Pallet Amazon, right when you enter the area, you see this gate. And you're like, okay. So the game is obviously telling me that I have to find the key and then open this gate to get to the end of the area. Obviously, right? Now, I'm going to show you the path that I took in the Pallet Amazon, but I've used some hacks to turn off the random battles because I really don't want to go through that pain again. Just keep in mind that throughout this whole journey, I'm being bombarded with Digimon at every step. I fought so many birds, plants, and dino humans. I've honestly massacred this area. Starting at the beginning, I go through some areas and take some wrong turns that lead to dead ends. But eventually, I went down to this spot right around here and that's where the key was. So now that I had the key, I went all the way back up to go to the pillar to unlock the gate. 
and after unlocking the gate, I keep pushing through, don't forget that I'm fighting a bunch of Digimon every few steps. And finally, finally, I'm greeted with a dead end. So, remember that spot where I picked up the key? Well, there's this path just to the right of it. That's where I'm supposed to go. I went through so many random battles trying to get this far, and it didn't even matter. I didn't need to pick up the key. I didn't even need to unlock the gate. What is this map design? What's the point? At least there's one good thing that came out of this. During all of this grinding, Bonbon bon and Pancho finally got strong enough to digivolve into the ultimate stages. Bonbon bon went from a Lekismon to a Cressamon, and Pancho went from a Geogamon to a Machine Geogamon. Their designs look super cool now, but also, they got really strong after digivolving. Cressamon learned an attack called Lunatic Dance that attacks two columns twice in a row, and Machine Geogamon learned a move called Geoga Tornado that attacks every single column on the screen. And these were super helpful against this area's boss, Mercurymon. Since these bosses take up three columns on the screen, these new moves were a godsend, letting me do a bunch of damage per turn. Beating Mercurymon was pretty easy thanks to Bonbon bon and Poncho. And Kronos is still in the rookie stage, kinda just there for moral support right now. Just like what happened with School Baluchimon, Mercurymon gives up another item called MD Word. This item will help restore more parts of the city. After returning to Dark Moon City to report to Julia, we conclude that Mercurymon and Skull Baluchimon are being hired by the same enemy to make and deliver these items, and our goal moving forward should be trying to find out more about who this enemy actually is. Now, for some more side quests. I beat up a bird in the Pal Amazon, and I battled some Digimon in a factory. I actually enjoyed the second mission quite a bit. It was a friendly tournament where we battled some cool Digimon who are low-key fans of us. It also helped that this area had an unusually low encounter rate and a smaller map, making it a lot easier to navigate through. During the side quest, Kronos finally digivolved from a Solarmon to a Clockmon, so now we're better prepared to take on the next Union quest. Normally, we'd get our Union quest from Julia, but this time we're greeted by her second in command, a tamer named Raigo. He tells us that Chief Julia has gone missing, and then tells us to investigate an area called Thriller Ruins without telling us any more details. And I'm like, hold up, Julia, our leader, is missing? Shouldn't we be looking for her? So we go to throw runes and grind through the area like usual, and at the end of the area, I get jumped by some of the previous bosses, Swobluchimon and Mercurymon. But now, there's also a new one called Gaiomon. The three of them are part of a group slash business called Kowloon Co, who make and distribute illegal items. I'm clearly outnumbered here, and this isn't looking good, but then, Ko comes to the rescue and takes on two of them for me. You know what, Ko? I didn't like you that much at the jungle, but now, you seem like a cool dude. So that left me with Gaimon to battle, and once again, I have to compliment the art in this game because his design looks so cool. This is probably one of my favorite designs in the whole game. After defeating Gaimon, the members of Kowloon Ko flee. Ko and I then have a chat. He informs me that Chief Glare and the other Light Fang Tamers have been acting really weird, and we decide to exchange emails just in case there's an emergency. I then head back to Darkman City to report to Julie- Wait, no, not Julia. She's still missing. I report back to Raigo and then continue on with some more side quests. For the first one, I beat up this really tall demon, and for the second one, I beat up this big frog. Actually, just kidding, I didn't even fight him. By now, every single side quest has had me fight some pretty strong mini-boss Digimon, but this mission is just a fetch quest where I talk to one. Which is fine I guess because it saves me some time, but also it's weird that there's this random fetch quest this late into the game. Anyways, after the side quest, we get our next union quest. For this union quest, I finally get to look for Chief Julia. Me and the other Nitro members meet up to figure out where to search, and I suggest bringing Ko over to help us out. Everyone else is a bit hesitant to invite him because of the whole jungle incident where they attacked us. And then, the game gives us some optional dialogue for the first time. But it's not really a choice, since both of these options obviously lead to Ko coming over to help. I don't know why they decided to make this dialogue choosable, since it's unnecessary. But anyways, Ko comes over. He tells us that a lot of Light Fang Tamers have been going to a place called Access Glacier lately, so I decide to go there to search for Julia. To set itself apart from the other maps we've been to before, Access Glacier has one neat gimmick, and it's that it connects to a second area called the Macro Sea. Two maps in one. Nice. What's not nice is that there's another dumb gate. You get a key here, and then the pillar to open the gate is 
right next to it. This is pretty pointless, but at least this gate actually opens a path for where we're supposed to go, unlike the one at the Pallet Amazon. When we get to the end of this area, we encounter Grimon, who is one of the first bosses we fought back in Limit Valley. He's imprisoned some Nitro members, Ko, Chaos Gauntmon, and Chief Julia. Grimon then starts monologuing, saying stuff like, This is an attack I improved with the Digi Intellectia? No one can withstand my Chrono DSR. Behold, Yggdrasil, I'll show you the power of my Ymir. Uh, did I miss a page of lore somewhere? After dumping all that dialogue on me, Grimon leaves, but not before mind controlling Chaos Gauntmon, who wakes up and attacks us. Despite being the lead Digimon of Nitro, this fight honestly wasn't that bad though. Except for the poison. Defeating Chaos Gauntmon snaps him out of his mind control, and not long after, Chief Julia wakes up confused but quickly recovers. Fortunately, it looks like Grimon failed to take control of the minds of Nitro, but he's probably taken over Light Fang and Sunshine City, which is why Ko said they were acting so weird before. It's not a good idea to send Ko back there, and since he doesn't have a home to go to right now, Julia asked me to let Ko stay at my house. Here, I'm given another choice in the dialogue, let Ko stay at my place, or say that I don't want to let him stay over. The first option is pretty normal and obvious, but the second one was interesting, and I wanted to see what happened if I chose it. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> During the next side quest, I fought some fishmen, and I fought Frankenstein. During these quests, Kronos digivolved from a Clockmon to a Nightmon, and has finally caught up to the other ultimates in my team. With three ultimates now, the next union quest should be a breeze. This union quest is called Merchant of Death. That sounds sick. But before getting into the details of the quest, Julia gives us a bit more context about the stuff Grimon said during our last union quest, like Ymir. A long time ago, before Dark Moon City even existed, there was an experiment called the Ymir Project. Digimon, being digital monsters, are technically immortal, but this experiment was trying to give Digimon normal, mortal lifespans like humans so that they could die. The experiment was cancelled, but the enemy got their hands on data from the Ymir project and is now using it like a virus to take over the digital world. And after that explanation, I'm honestly still kinda confused. So it looks like this game is implying that there's some other, greater, mysterious enemy besides just Grimon that we should be worrying about, but I still don't know why they're trying to take over the digital world. Anyways, Julia then gives us the details for this quest. The virus activity is the strongest in Sunshine City where Light Fang is, so Necro's next goal is to restore the center bridge between the two cities so that we can go over there and stop it. The only person who might know how to restore the bridge is the Merchant of Death, Grand Drachmon, who's also a newly introduced member of Kowloon Co. Their hideout is in a place called Proxy Island, so I head over there to negotiate. And by negotiate, I mean beat them up so that they work with me. Once we get to Proxy Island, it's the same old story like the other Union Quest. I grind through the area, get in a lot of random battles, and then get to the end. I encounter all the members of Kowloon Co at their hideout. Now if they all attack me here at once, I'd definitely be a goner. But they instead say that if all of them ganged up on someone at once, it hurt Kowloon Co's reputation. Grand Drachmon then decides to be polite and says that if I'm able to beat him, he'll help out Nitro repair the bridge. I thought I'd be well prepared for this fight having three ultimates on my team, but I was wrong. I know it's late into the game to say this, but I think I'm supposed to be training a bit more before getting into these boss fights. I love my Digimon, but I feel like I get into a lot of these battles where I barely do any damage and constantly have to heal to survive. This fight was rough. Eventually, I'm able to beat Grand Drachmon, and all the other Kowloon members aren't sure what to do after that and consider running away like usual. But Grand Drachmon proudly claims that Kowloon Co never breaks a promise, and affirms that all of them will go to Dark Moon City to help us with the bridge. After that Union Quest, I was able to get my first Mega Digimon. Bonbon bon Digivolved from a Crestmon to a Dianamon, and I think the nickname I gave her doesn't fit that well anymore. When I named Bonbon bon as a Lunamon, she was like a cute little bunny, but now as a Dianamon, she uh, kinda looks like she's gonna step on me. Anyways, let's go over the next side quest. For one of them, I went to Proxy Island to collect some nuts. And for the second one, I had to find someone called Lilymon. And oh my god, finding Lilymon might have been the worst quest in this game. It might have been worse than the Pallet Amazon, which I didn't think would be possible. I was supposed to find Lilymon and resist their jungle, but instead I was just led on a wild goose chase having to find and battle 4 Digimon, only to find out that Lilymon wasn't even there. There is so much wrong with this quest, and I honestly don't want to talk about it anymore. 
If you somehow play Dusk and get this far, you'll know what I mean. Let's just move on to our Union Quest. This Union Quest is called The Final Battle. While Julia and I talk about how Center Bridge is being restored, Scobal Uchamon and Co. barge in saying that there's an emergency. Light Fang Tamers are gathering on the other side of the bridge and are planning to invade us. Scobal Uchamon then has a spiel about how he and Cal and Co. will protect their clients and they'll make sure that Light Fang doesn't break through. Over the course of this game, the members of Cal and Co. have really grown on me. Sure, they do some sketchy stuff, but they follow through with their work and make sure to please their clients. They just seem like a goofy group of dudes that'd be fun to hang out with. At the bridge, some members of Cal and Co. are making sure the bridge is secure. But on the side, Skull Bluchamon and Co. are having a secret conversation. They figured out a secret way into Sunshine City without using the bridge, and Co.'s planning to sneak in there to fight Chief Glare and snap him out of his mind control. But they find out that I'm eavesdropping in on them. Then, Co. says that I should be the one to stop Chief Glare. Hmm? Why me? Why just me? I don't see why at least the two of us could go in there and fight together, but alas, I head in alone. Sunshine City is a mere image of Darkmoon City, which is cool. Except there's a bunch of random encounters here. Not so cool. I go around the city fighting Light Fang Tamers until I get access to the room where Chief Glare and Ophanimon are. They tell me that I'm something called a real being, that I have no place in the digital world, so I must be deleted. This version of Ophanimon is one of my favorite Digimon designs in the game, up there with Gaiamon's design. She looks so freaking cool here. But the battle itself wasn't actually that difficult, and I defeat her. In the battle's aftermath, Ophanimon is able to break free of her mind control, kicking out this pyramid thing called Chronocore from her body. Chronocore then creates an entrance to a new area called Chaos Brain, where he'll be waiting for our arrival. This area has a lot of cool virus-themed Digimon, and some, uh, metal monkeys? The end of this area obviously has this game's final boss, and I think I was supposed to have a full team of Mega Stage Digimon by now, but I only had one Mega and two Ultimates. I really didn't feel like grinding for who knows how long to digivolve Poncho and Kronos, so I decided to just fight the boss with this team as is. At the end of the area, I encounter Grimmon, who fuses together with Chronocore to become Chaos Grimmon. We battle, and this fight honestly isn't that bad. Of course I run into the usual stuff like poison and having to manage some of my turns for healing, but I'm feeling pretty good here. Well, after the battle ended, it didn't take too long for that feeling to go away. In desperation, Chaos Grimmon digivolves into Exo Grimmon and unleashes an attack that knocks me out. And then, he starts explaining his grand villain plan. You know you could have started explaining that stuff before knocking me out. Now that I'm unconscious, it kind of defeats the purpose of your monologue here. Anyways, he says that first, he's gonna erase all real beings from existence. Okay, so that kind of makes sense as a motivation. I'm guessing it's one of those situations where this guy thinks that Digimon are the superior species and should thrive without humans. I can roll with that narrative. But after that, he says he'll also destroy the entire digital world. So you want to eliminate all Digimon too? Then what? You'll just sit in the void for all eternity? This sounds like a horrible plan. Eventually, Exogrimon finishes talking, and as I lay on the ground, he prepares to unleash his final attack to destroy the digital world. But then, through cyberspace, I hear my friends in Dark Moon City cheering me on. The power of friendship wakes me out of my stupor, and then I battle Exogrimon. And holy moly, he tore me a new one. Exogrimon has attacks that not only deal a lot of damage, but they have the added effect of lowering my Digimon's attack and defense stats. So within a few turns, my Digimon were doing even less damage than they usually do, while also being prone to dying in like, two hits. I had to use a lot of revives and heals this battle. Cronus was the MVP here because he was an absolute tank, having the most defense among my Digimon. The only reason I was even able to pull off using items for healing is probably because Cronus kept surviving attack after attack. I was finally so close to defeating Exo Grimmon, but ran out of healing items. He had a streak of attacking multiple turns in a row, and had to watch in horror as he annihilated my Digimon. Cronus was so close to putting in the final blow, but Exo Grimmon got a critical hit at the last moment and ended the fight. I was playing this game for a really long time at this point, and this battle lasted for over half an hour. I was tired, and I was planning on putting this game down for a little while to come back to later. But then, I was reminded of something that I had forgotten. I've got my backup Digimon. So it turns out the three extra Digimon you have aren't just there to leech off EXP, and you can actually switch them into battle if your party goes down. I've been Digivolving these guys in the background for fun and haven't fought with them yet. I kind of forgot they were even there in the heat of battle. All it took was one attack from Giggles, and Exogrimmon was defeated. 
It's kind of a shame that my main party couldn't benefit from all the EXP of this battle, but I'm just glad that it's over. The body of Grimon fades away, only leaving Chronocore behind. In its dying breath, it laments, if only Chronomon were here, and vanishes from existence. Who's Chronomon? Oh, we're in the credits now. Okay. Um. Let's go into final thoughts. Before making this video, I looked on YouTube to see what others have said about Digimon Dusk and Dawn, and I noticed one of the more popular reviews was called Digimon World Dawn is a Waste of Time. And at first when I read that, I kind of felt offended. Like, how dare you talk about my precious baby like this? But then I actually played the game again after all these years and came to the terrible realization of, oh god, this game is kind of wasting my time. Let's do an overview of some key points of Digimon Dusk. First off, the gameplay. If I were to briefly describe Digimon Dusk gameplay, I will describe it as clunky and repetitive. I felt like there were too many random encounter battles and they took way too long. Every time you enter a battle, it slowly loads in every Digimon so I gotta wait for that. And then every time a Digimon attacks, I gotta wait for the attack animation to load. Look how long it takes me to start a battle and to put in one attack. It's not great. And then there's the maps where you'll be spending most of your time, and it makes things worse. The way their design makes it so easy to get lost and forces you to backtrack so much. I'm still not over how poorly designed the Pallet Amazon was. Like, who thought that was a good idea? And then the quest. Who's hard to care about completing them because they didn't matter to the main story? Side quests are supposed to be optional things a player can do for fun to further immerse themselves in a video game's world. But this game was kind of like, eh, we don't have enough content here so let's just force the player to do all these side quests in order to progress. They just felt like chores. I clocked in about 17 hours being Digimon Dusk but I felt like over half of it was filled with fluff. It's a bit futile to suggest improvement since this game is over 10 years old but I've listed out a few things that could have been done to make the gameplay more bearable. One more thing I almost forgot to mention, the boss fights. They were pretty challenging, but that's probably because I was kinda rushing and not training my Digimon enough. I actually like the boss fights, it's just a shame that I had to slog through so many random encounters to get to them. My only issue with the bosses is that sometimes the power scaling seemed kinda off. Some would be kinda easy, while others were absurdly hard, and that lack of linear progression felt a bit awkward at times. There's probably a lot more things about the gameplay that I could've talked about, but these are the main points that come to mind. Now, let's talk about the story. I didn't get it. Sure, it's a game for kids so like, I'm not expecting that much, but throughout my playthrough I didn't even know who the bad guy even was and why all this bad stuff was even happening. Really late into the game, a bunch of context was abruptly introduced, like the Digion Telekia and Ymir. And even after the final battle, I felt like I had more questions than answers. I don't get why this dude wants to destroy the digital world, and who the hell is Chronomon? I did read somewhere that a lot of Digimon Dust story, like the Digion Telekia and Chronomon, could actually be explained through a previous Digimon game, so take my confusion with a grain of salt. But despite that fact, the story contained within THIS game leads much to be desired. There was a distinct lack of any kind of character development or lessons to be learned here. Some dialogue was entertaining though. Of course, shout out to Cal and Co. They started out as a bunch of bad guys, but now they just feel like a bunch of big goofballs. And I enjoyed the dialogue between these two characters sometimes. They had a fun little dynamic going on. But again, there wasn't really any character development here. It's not like Kowloon Co started out as bad and then eventually grew to be good guys. They've just always stuck to their shtick as being shady businessmen. Now, I'm gonna ramble and give a shot at slightly redoing some of the points of the story, and I'm not sure if these are actually good suggestions. But here goes. Remember in Resistor Jungle when Co said that Nycro were the bad guys? But what if he was actually right, and the virus was able to infiltrate the leadership of Nycro and was working behind the scenes? Later on when Julia went missing and Raigo took her place, what if Raigo was actually working with the bad guys to take over Darkman City, and ensure his own survival or something? This would also explain what Grimmon said in the beginning of the game about how we'd perish by the hands of one of our own, which didn't actually amount to anything in the original story. Over time during our missions with Kowloon Co, we could sprinkle in a bit of character development by having them slowly begin to realize that the things they're doing are bad, and they'll start making decisions for the good of the digital world rather than for their business or money. I think these changes make the story more interesting and cohesive, and the more obscure lore about Ymir and Chronomon can still stay. Next, let's talk about another aspect of the game, the music. It was a bit of a bummer that music was reused in areas, and in some cases, they were areas that we had to do back-to-back -back missions in. That repetition made me dislike some of the tracks, despite them not actually being that bad. But besides that one irk, I thought that most of the music here was actually pretty good. 
A few of the tracks I especially liked were the Process Factory theme, the World Map theme, and my favorite one, the Farm Island theme. Finally, let's talk about the art. This was the best aspect of the game in my opinion, specifically the Digimon art. There was also a lot of map art in this game, but I found many of them to feel monotonous after a while. There are some smaller areas like the Tamer Home that had a surprising amount of detail and unique structures put into them, and I wish the same effort went to maps of the wild areas where we spent most of our time. This is a pretty big ask though, and probably impossible given the timeline the developers and artists had to work with. The Digimon more than made up for some of the lackluster map art. Their designs and animations look great, except these ones. I don't like those ones very much. I remember on my DS, I would spend hours just grinding through airs to try to discover new Digimon, and looking through the Digivolution trees of my team to see all the different kinds that existed. But it turns out that almost all the Digimon sprites are reused from a previous game, Digimon World DS. This doesn't detract from my appreciation of the art in this game, but it does bring up the question of what does this game really have on its own to boast about. Now that I've played Digimon World Dusk after all these years, it's not quite as good as I remember it to be. There's a lot of fantastic art and music to appreciate here, but to experience it, you're going to have to persevere through time consuming and repetitive gameplay. And unless you have knowledge from previous Digimon games, you're probably not going to completely understand the story either. I used to immerse myself in Digimon Dusk and would gladly spend hours of my time in the digital world, but now, I no longer have the patience for the grind this game requires. Despite what I've said though, I still love this game, and it'll always hold a special place in my heart. The wonder I had as a kid exploring these areas and taming powerful Digimon to fight along my side is something that I'll always cherish. <laughs>